Welcome everyone. I hope wherever you are, you're enjoying a beautiful winter day. For those of you unfamiliar with Icelandic Roots, it is a nonprofit organization to promote and preserve our Icelandic heritage, culture, genealogy, and history. And it recently celebrated its ninth anniversary. To learn more, I encourage you to visit the website at www.icelandicroots.com. And you'll also find the organization on Facebook and Instagram as well. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available a little bit later on the Icelandic Roots YouTube channel. Since it's being held in the webinar format, all participants other than the panelists are muted and will not be visible. We encourage you to submit questions and comments using the Q&A section usually found at the bottom of your computer screen on the Zoom format. My name is Jody Armand Jones. I am a volunteer with Icelandic Roots coming to you from Minnesota. And also joining me is Doug Hansen, another volunteer coming from Virginia, who's monitoring the technical side of things. And then of course we have our wonderful presenter today, Susan Huff, who is coming to us from the Spanish Fork, Utah area. And before I introduce Susan, I just wanted to uh, mention that I remember, uh, and uh, unfortunately this is probably dating myself, but I do remember um, in, on January 23rd, 1973, when this eruption took place, I was a freshman in college and um, was just fascinated, A, that they were able to get all the residents safely off an island in the middle of the ocean, and uh, B, to prevent that volcanic eruption from completely devastating the island. And uh, the second thing that occurred is last May, my uh, daughter and her husband who live in Iceland were looking for housing. And one of the things we ran into was that about that time, of course, all these, uh, what, some 5,000 people needed a place to stay and housing was not readily available. And so quite a few homes were kind of thrown up very quickly and, and rapidly in order to house these people. And um, we ran into uh, a number of them uh, while we were on this search for a new home for my family. But much ado about nothing, Susan is here. She is the descendant of Western Icelanders and as I mentioned, lives in Spanish Fork, Utah. She and her husband Richard lived and volunteered in Iceland for two and a half years in the late um, teens, 20 teens. And she perhaps will tell us a little bit more about her time as a records preservation missionary. Susan holds a bachelor degree in elementary education and master's and doctorate degrees in educational leadership. And without further ado, I am going to turn this over to you, Susan. I'm very interested to hear what you have to say and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jody. Let me share my screen. I'm happy to be here today to talk about the 50th anniversary of the volcanic eruption at Westman Islands. And speaking as a genealogist, not as a geologist. So I'll put that clarifier right from the beginning. I'm a, a genealogist and I'm a descendant of Icelanders. Um, and I don't speak Icelandic. So I, unfortunately I should have worked harder to learn it when we lived there, but I'm happy to share some information with you today about this significant event in Iceland. I love the geology of Iceland. It, it's such a unique and spectacularly beautiful country. I first visited Iceland in 2012 with my husband. We were there to see where my father's family came from. And then Jody mentioned my husband and I actually got to live in Iceland when we were volunteers with Family Search as records preservation missionaries for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So we worked at the National Archives of Iceland. We have had an office job and we were there scanning the Icelandic documents that are housed there. So we scanned parish records, ministerial books, census records, legal records. And then as we completed a set of records and those records were published on the National Archives of Iceland website for anyone to access. We had um, many opportunities on, on the weekends and on holidays when the archives 
was closed to, and, and we weren't working, we could go around and see much of the country. So we had, it was a really wonderful opportunity to be able to live there and to be able to see the homeland of where, where my father's family came from. Today, I have five objectives that I'd like to accomplish with you. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the geology of Westman Islands or Westman Air. We're, we'll talk specifically about the eruption uh, on Westman Air, about the evacuation of the island of Haiti, about the harbor, and then just concluding with a little bit about Westman Air today. So a volcanic activity is really integral to Iceland. Iceland lies astride the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where the North American and the Eurasian plates are moving apart, which makes Iceland a center of volcanic activity and geothermal activity. There are 35 documented volcanoes on the catalog of Icelandic volcanoes. The one I'm talking about today on Vestmanir is the island of Hemi, the, or the Eldfell volcano that began erupting on the 23rd of January, and the eruption ended on the 28th of June, 1973. So, this volcano was erupting for 157 days. Also in the Vestman era, on, there was a new island that was formed between 1963 and 1967, Surtsey Island. The world became a lot more aware of Iceland in 2010 when the E15 volcano erupted because it impacted air travel throughout much of the world. And then another, a volcano erupted in 2022 that the world became aware of. So this volcano erupted out near the airport, um, out near Grindavik on the Reykjanes Peninsula. So people became a lot more aware of volcanoes in Iceland through these eruptions. So this map from the uh, catalog of Icelandic volcanoes shows uh, visually where the volcanoes that are cataloged have occurred. So you can see some of the Snæfellsnes Peninsula, then the Reykjanes Peninsula around Reykjavik. It doesn't have the latest eruption that would be about in this area here in the south, the middle of the island. So really everywhere except the West Fjords and the east of Iceland, there are not any cataloged eruptions but pretty much everywhere else uh, around Iceland. So the Vestmanir Archipelago, which is an island chain, it lies 12 kilometers off the south coast of Iceland. It consists of 15 islands and 30 skerries or small rocky islands and many sea stacks. These are all formed from eruptions. In the foreground right here, this bigger, biggest island is a picture of the Surtsey Island, which was again erupted from 1963 to 1967. But there's only one island that is inhabited year round and it's Hamey or Home Island. And it's the only settlement in this archipelago that is inhabited all year. Because there are few natural harbors in the South, of Iceland because the south is really rich with fishing grounds. The harbor at Vestmanir ha has consistently been the center of Iceland's fishing industry. So Vestmanir is important. It's important to the economy of the whole country. And it's a very beautiful place. So I took some pictures as from the ferry. You can see the islands and sea stacks such a beautiful, beautiful place to see. This is looking back toward the mainland of Iceland. Just evidence of volcanic activity everywhere you look. So this photo was taken in 1972 before the volcanic eruption. And you can see the town of Vestmanair on the island of Hamey, and here's the harbor. Um, and then everything changed in 1973. Turbulent seas and severe storms made it unsafe for fishing. So 
almost the entire fishing fleet of 60 to 70 fishing boats were in the harbor at Vestmanere. The occupants of the island, Hamey, slumbered away in a deep winter sleep when they were awakened in the early morning of the 23rd of January, 1973, around 2 a.m. by fire engine sirens sounding their alarms. A volcanic eruption had begun on the island without warning. This was the beginning of Iceland's largest natural disaster in recent history, the eruption of the Elfell volcano. Elfell is in English, hill of fire. So there was some seismic activity that was picked up in the, on the mainland about two days before, but the people at Vesemir had no warning. They were anticipating that there could be volcanic activity anywhere in Iceland. And so Iceland's civil defense is always prepared and ready to go into action. Within six hours of the eruption's onset, almost all of the island's 5,300 inhabitants had been evacuated to the mainland by boat. Some people remained behind to try to save belongings and, and houses and structures and others stayed to perform essential functions. But there were a few people who couldn't go by boat, mostly elderly and people who were, were hospital patients. And those people were evacuated by air. Planes were sent from Reykjavik and Keflavik to help evacuate those people. But amazingly, by the end of the day, all evacuees were spread around the mainland, housed by family, friends, and strangers. But back in Hemi, the eruption continued. A fissure 300 meters in length had opened up at about 1.55 a.m. on January 23rd on the eastern side of the island, about a kilometer from the center of town. A fissure rapidly expanded to the length of two kilometers. It crossed the entire island from one shore to the other. And then this spectacular lava flowing began with curtains of fire 50 to 150 meters high. And it occurred all along the fissure during the first few hours of the eruption. Then soon, the eruption was centered in one vent about a mile and a half, uh, or excuse me, a half mile from the, the old volcanic cone of Helgefell, just outside the eastern edge of town. Within two days, the lava flow had built a cylinder, a cinder cone 100 meters or 30, 100, 330 feet high. The thick lava flow fold, flowed slowly and relentlessly toward the north, the northeast and the east of the island. So this picture shows the cloud of ash and steam coming from the island. It was taken two days after the eruption started. So I was looking for permission to use this, this picture because it's a copyrighted photo. And I found that Maurice and Katya Kraft who were French volcanologists who actually devoted their lives to studying volcanoes, they took this picture. And they were, sadly they were killed in 1991 from the pyroclastic flow of a volcano in Japan. So just evidence that studying volcanoes and being around them is, is dangerous business. In addition to the lava flow, the island was threatened by tephra fall. That's small rock fragments that are ejected from the volcano. Closet, houses that were closest to the rift were soon destroyed by lava flows and tephra fall. This picture shows the lava tongue that was moving across the island. Lava bombs and advancing lava destroyed some houses as they set fire and burned the houses. Many houses were destroyed by the weight of the ashfall. 
but crews of volunteers worked to clear ash from roofs and board up windows, and that saved many houses. By the end of January, Tefra covered most of the island, reaching a depth of 16 feet in some places. I thought this was an amazing picture of the lava bombs that came from the crater. By early February, Tefra Fall had stopped, but the lava flows continued and they caused serious damage. The greatest threat was the lava flow toward the harbor. Losing this harbor would not only have a significant impact on the fishing industry of Vestmanir, but on the economy of, the, of Iceland as a whole. There had been previous attempts to slow lava flow with sprayed water. They'd been tried in Hawaii and Mount Etna on a much smaller scale and with very limited success. However, Thornbjörg Sigurdsson, professor of physics at University of Iceland Science Institute, had conducted his own experiments as the new volcanic island of Surtsey was forming between 1963 and 1967. So in his experiment, water was sprayed onto that lava flow that was advancing into the lagoon near the scientific observation hut. Professor Sigurdsson proved that advancing lava could be impeded through cooling with seawater and prematurely solidifying the advancing lava flow front. So he became a very strong proponent of spraying seawater on the lava flow at Eltville to prematurely cool the lava with the idea that the congealed lava would create a barrier to the upstream lavas, thus sparing the harbor and preventing fur further damage to the structures in the town. He was very persuasive and his efforts resulted in a lava cooling operation that began on the 7th of February in 1973 and it ended on the 10th of July, 1973 when lava stopped flowing from Eltfell. The first attempt to slow the lava flow was made by firemen from the fire department at Westmanair two weeks after the volcano started erupting. They began spraying seawater on the head wall of the creeping lava. And this seemed to make a difference. So more powerful pumps and increasing numbers of pumps were ordered from the mainland of Iceland. These pumps were not powerful enough to reach the top of the lava edge. It was not possible to get the hoses closer because the lava edge was steep, it was hot, and it was constantly moving. And you can just see from these pictures that this was very dangerous work and hard work. And then on March 1st, the dredging boat Sandy arrived and it began spraying seawater on the lava flow. This was perfect timing because at the same time, a large chunk of the new mountain wall broke loose and it was being carried by the lava toward the harbor. It even split in two and one big chunk of it was moving in the lava flow toward the harbor. But the Sandy did its job and the lava tongue was cooled which prevented this large chunk from continuing toward the harbor. But it was determined that if the lava flow was to be stopped, more powerful pumps were needed. So a formal request for assistance was made. And two weeks later, on March 26th, the first delivery of pumping equipment came by air from the United States. In total, 32 pumps arrived from the United States which gave the Icelanders the necessary pumping capacity to stop the lava flow. This volcanic eruption had produced a new mountain, 220 meters or 720 feet high. This is an aerial view showing the steam that's coming from the water being applied. This is a picture of Magnus Magnusson, who was 
at the time, the mayor of Vestmanair, he was one of many people who were working to save the harbor at Westmanair. It's just so overwhelming to see all the ash and tephra that was left in addition to the lava flow. After three months of continuous activity, S. Thorson reported on the 21st of April that, quote, the Hamey eruption is slowly abating, the explosive activity is now intermittent, and the estimated lava production is less than five cubic centimeters per second. The area of the lava flow is 2.1 square kilometers, and the average thickness is about 70 meters. The height of the volcano is approximately 220 meters or 720 feet high. So this was on April 21st, but the volcano continued to erupt until the 28th of June. It had just slowed down a lot. During and after the eruption, there was a massive cleanup and restoration effort that was necessary to remove the ash and tephra. And again, this was also dangerous work, dangerous and hard work. The destruction was just overwhelming. The baby buggy in the front of the picture was interesting to see. Going street by street and home by home, clearing away the tephra and the lava, I thought this was an int interesting picture where water was pumped as the lava flow was coming down the street and they actually halted the flow of lava on the street. Massive cleanup effort. just shows the magnitude of the destruction from the lava. Even a year and a half later, they were still dealing with the effects of the ash and tephra. So this picture was taken in July of 1974, and another one from that same time period. This is the cemetery at Vestmanera, and you can see it's just, covered with ash. In this picture, this is the entrance to the cemetery. So this was a natural disaster, but there were actually some benefits from this volcano. So first the island size was increased by 20%. So about a square mile of land was added to Hamey Island. And as they worked to control the narrowing of the harbor, they actually improved the harbor. They improved the shelter and provided a, a breakwater for the harbor. And as residents started to return to Vestmanair, they used the heat from cooling lava for hot water and it generated electricity. As they cleared away the tephra, they had to have some place to put it. So they extended the runway and then they made an, a landfill area for 200 new houses. The most amazing benefit was this scientific experiment that was conducted that had never been done at, at this level anywhere in the world. The experiment of cooling and hardening lava flow with seawater. And this has important ramifications for other areas of the world that are, are threatened by volcanoes. Only about 2,000 residents initially returned to Vestmanair after the eruption. Even now, 50 years after the evacuation of the island, the current population of Vestmanair, 4,135, has not reached the 1973 population of 
5,300. According to the city's website, about 400 current inhabitants are foreigners and about half of those are from Poland. I thought that was interesting. So Vesmanera has returned to a thriving fishing community, but it requires a much smaller labor force. Now ships are larger and they're more technologically advanced and production has moved from land-based freezing installations to factory ships. So this picture shows people returning, visiting the church as they return to Vesmanair. So this picture taken, this aerial view taken in 2006, you can see the lava flow. And here's the Eldfell cone, Eldfell cone uh, here and the Helgafell cone in front of it. A side view of those cones, here's Helgafell and Eldfell. And you can also see this fissure this is a good view of the fissure that developed across the island. When I put the pictures side by side from 1972 and 2006, there, I made some fun observations. So you can see here's the harbor, this big area here that is now in 2006 photo filled in. But I thought this was amazing. Look at this rock, all these rocks here that were there in 1972 and the were just melted by the lava flow. It's now all flat area here. So it's not exactly the same perspective. The pictures weren't taken, but here you can see this rock formation compared here, but it's a good way to compare and see the changes that happened from the volcanic eruption. This is a picture of Eldfell taken from the ocean I don't know if you can see them, but at the top of the cone, there are some people standing there. So you can actually hike this volcano cone, which I did with my family. And it's a beautiful view of all the surrounding area. So this diagram shows how the coast of, of Hemi changed. So about 6,000 years ago, this, island that is, or this part of Hemi, the southernmost peninsula was formed. And then there was another island here in the north. When the Helga fell volcano erupted about a thousand years later, so 5,000 years ago, the Helga fell eruption was big enough that it connected these two islands and made a bigger land mass. And if we look at the diagram here, we can see Here's how much land was added two days after the eruption. By January 29th, this lighter gray area. By February 7th, and then the darkest gray area was added by March 12th. You can see the narrowing of the harbor. In this diagram, you can see the fissure that erupted that went entirely across the island from one shore to the other. This aerial view shows a picture of how the island grew in mass from the volcanic eruption. In this picture, you can see the blackened area is what was added, the land mass that was added. This is a picture of Kari Bjarnason. He's an historian at the Folk Museum on Vesemir, and I collaborated with Kari sharing information uh, about my ancestors that lived on Westman Island. So Car when we visited, my husband and I visited in 2012, Kari took me around and showed me where my different family members lived on Westman Island. And then he took me on top of the lava flow and showed me that my grandmother's, my great grandmother's house would have been right directly under where we were standing um, on, on the island. So that was fun to perspective to think about what it was like before the, the volcano erupted. So I took some pictures of the, the lava flow. This is looking back toward the mainland. More of the lava flow. 
Everywhere you look, you can see evidence of volcanic activity. It's just such a beautiful place. This is looking actually the, on the other side of the island, looking out toward the ocean. Remember the cemetery I showed you a few minutes ago that was covered with ash, the entrance to the cemetery. When I visited first in 2012, I took a picture of the cemetery. And you can see that right there uh, on the left, that entrance to the cemetery. That helps me to get a perspective of really how much work and effort was involved in clearing all the ash and tephra it was a monumental effort by the Icelanders to bring the island back to its current state. Vestmanir is famous for puffins. People come to see puffins on the island. It's the largest puffin colony in Europe. This picture I took actually in the West Fjords of puffins. When we were there, I've, I went to Vestmanir three different times, but it wasn't the right time to back actually see puffins. So there's a picture of them from the West Fjords. Vestmanir is just such a fun place to visit. My grandkids had a blast. They came to visit, visit us in Iceland and we I went with my daughter and her family. We went to the island and they're fun restaurants. Just hanging out in the town was so much fun. It was, it's a really fun place to visit. Vestmanir has a great golf course, a world-class golf course. You can see in the background here. It's considered to be one of the 200 best golf courses in the world. And on the edge of the golf course is this angel statue that the Icelandic Association of Utah erected to commemorate the 410 Icelanders who, who left Iceland and emigrated to Spanish Fork, Utah. And it has the names of my 17 of my family members who emigrated from Iceland over a 30 year period. So the, the names of those 410 Icelanders are on this monument. And then we have the same monument without the angel statue at the top, we have at the Icelandic Memorial in Spanish Fork. So from the edge of the, the golf course, you can see this, it's called Elephant Rock. That's the side view of it. But here's a better view of Elephant Rock. People come to see Elephant Rock on Vestmanair. And they come to enjoy the beauty of Vestmanair. Looking out from the golf course, seeing that you can see the tide pools, that change as the tide comes in and goes out. Vestmanir is a fun place to hike. I mentioned we hiked the Eldfell Volcano Crater. This is a trail. These are my kids that are hiking up to just off the golf course. And you can hike up to this ridge. You probably can't see people on the top, but you can hike all along this ridge. And if um, you can, this is a place where you can see puffins nesting. And then when you come down the other side, there's this fun rock swing that you can, this rope swing that you can swing on. My daughter, was, this is a picture of my daughter on this swing. I took this picture from the ferry, just looking back at the harbor entrance, you can just see the narrowing of the lava flow. Um, it, just the miraculous efforts to halt that lava flow and save the harbor. When I first visited Vestman there in 2012, you could actually walk uh, among the tephra and you could see the excavation efforts that were being made. You could see evidence of the destruction. But then two years later, they opened this volcano museum. They actually built a, a museum over some of the destroyed structures to preserve them from the elements and to make an educational interactive museum that's what this museum has won awards for its excellence. So you can go in the museum, this is the outside of the museum, and you can see some of the preserved parts of the eruption. So tourism is alive and well in Iceland. And you can see this ferry boat here that is docked in this man-made harbor that's only about 12 kilometers from Westmanair. 
So I don't, I don't really pronounce it. Anyway, this is the name of the harbor. It was made specifically for the ferry to go back and forth. And it takes about 40 to 45 minutes to go on the ferry to West Monero now to go this 12 kilometers. But sometimes in the winter, the waters to the seas are too rough. And often in the winter, this harbor fills up with sand. And so the ferry can't operate from here. And so the ferry has to go the clear around to Thorlokshofen, whereas which is where the the Icelanders would have evacuated to in 1973. So Thorlokshofen is 75 kilometers away. It takes just under three hours to get there now. So this is where the Icelanders were evacuated by fishing boat. So tourism, people come to Westman Island to see the puffins. There's also a beluga whale sanctuary there. Surtsey is the island that was formed from 1963 to 1967. This is a UNESCO protected site. Scientists come to study the flora and fauna that were generated on a new island and really to learn how a new island begins. There's the fun rope swing, the elephant rock, the folk museum that has some amazing displays about the history of Iceland. There's Mount Eldfell and this wonderful volcano museum where you can learn more about volcanic eruptions there. There's a big festival, the first weekend of July at Westminster. It commemorates the end of the volcanic eruption of 1973. It's a four day festival that goes over the weekend. There are thousands of visitors that come. One, on one of my trips to Westminster, we were there right before the festival. And so we saw all the setup that they were doing. So a lot of people come and they camp. There's a lot of music. It's a big music festival, a lot of food, a lot of drinking, a lot of people. So I would just suggest if you want to visit Vestminer that you maybe avoid that, that um, first weekend of July to come and visit. So thinking about the, this volcanic eruption and just thinking about 50 years later, Vestminer is it's a laboratory for geologists and it's a major tourist attraction as we commemorate 50 year, the 50 year anniversary of this volcanic eruption, it's a really good time to reflect on the perseverance, the courage, the fortitude and the ingenuity of Icelanders as they responded to this natural disaster with the help from foreign friends. It's been fun for me to study the volcanic eruption and to learn about the town where my great grandmother was born and she lived with her family before they emigrated to Spanish Fork. So with that, and I'm going to turn it over for any questions or comments. Thank you so much, Susan. A couple of comments have come in while you've been talking. The very, uh, one of them is uh, compliments on your photos, just uh, spectacular photos, uh, very helpful in telling the story. Uh, another one was, could you please explain what a C stack is? A C stack is, a, a volcanic eruption, when it comes above the level of the ocean, it's not of magnitude to form an island. So it's on a much smaller scale. So all through that archipelago, so there are 15 islands and then there's bigger formations and the sea stacks are just the smaller version that's not big enough to be classified as an island or a Surtsey. Wonderful. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, did you, by any chance, have any relatives that were living on the island at the time of the eruption? I did, actually. In, in 2012, I met some of my Icelandic cousins. We um, tracked them down and they invited us to their home. It was so interesting because they were very much aware of us and they told us a little bit about their experience. Um, living there. Uh, they actually pulled a book off the shelf that had the names of my father and his siblings, my, my grandfather. They were really curious about what had happened to us. They knew that we had left 
in the late 1800s. Our family had left and they wondered if we were still alive and, and what had happened. So it was fun to go back and visit with them and get their perspective of the cleanup effort that was involved in restoring, restoring Vestman Air. A uh, question has come in from Brenda. Would there be any tour buses from Reykjavik? So that's a good question. Um, I saw, you can, you can arrange tours to Vestman Air. When we went on the ferry, this ferry that's shown in the picture, there's a big parking lot and there were tour buses. We had, we had a car because we were living there, but uh, the first time we went, we, we went, we were in a rental car. If you have a car, a rental car, you can actually drive your car right on the ferry if you choose mm -hmm. to. The island is small enough that you really don't need a car when you get to Westman Air. You can walk um, to most of the sites that you want to see. Uh, the first time I went, we, um, we took our rental car, uh, but I know there were a lot, there were people who came on a bus and then took the ferry and in an organized tour. So you could you could look for a tour that had that had a bus from Reykjavik to this ferry. Correct. There are also uh, in the summer there are usually two places from which you can take the ferry: one closer to to Reykjavik, and one closer towards Vik, not far from Hetla. Um, there's also an airplane or an airport so that you can fly as well. Um, so there's a variety of place of ways to get there. Uh, we have another question. Where did the ash get moved to after the evacuation? Also, the air quality must have been horrific, yet many in the pictures did not wear a gas mask or protective face coverings. How long would the air quality be poor? Was there residual health challenges following the inhalation of this air? And then he just mentions, uh, this has been a wonderful visual presentation. Thank you. That's a great question. That's one thing I didn't study was the health effects of the volcanic eruption. And I, I'm, I'm assuming that there were many. The majority of the tephra was used to, to extend the runway. Uh, so it had been a single runway and then it was turned into a T runway. I'm just going to go back to the one photo really quickly that shows um, the comparison. I'll see if I can find it, what the tephra was used for. Right here. So this comparison, you can see this part of 2006, all of these new houses that were added. So the tephra was taken to expand the airport and to, and to just fill in this area of the island so that there could be new housing that was made there. So they made good use of it. And even around the, the volcano cone, the Elfell cone, the road that you can, we drove around was all made from the tephra. So they used it to improve the infrastructure around the island, the roads and the new housing and the runway. Excellent, thank you. Uh, comment from Heather, thanks so much for this, Susan and IR volunteers, fascinating. Uh, Catherine says, what is the current risk of another eruption? The photos are wonderful, thank you. That's a great question, and sorry, I skipped over that part. So I'm, glad, <laughs> I'm glad you asked that because I was actually gonna talk about that. So right now, um, Elfell is, considered an active volcano. Elkafell is considered a dormant volcano. So geologists uh, think, they assume that there will be another volcanic eruption at Vestman Air. They're estimating between that it will happen in 500 to 1500 years from now. So they're feeling relatively secure about Vestman Air at the current time and as we were talking about the volcanic eruption, it was the lava flow was slow enough that people could be evacuated, that they could work to control the lava flow. And that doesn't always happen in a volcanic mm -hmm. eruption. So there are um, devices that are put in place. ISIN is constantly monitoring and measuring the seismic activity 
in Iceland so that they are, they can monitor and alert people because you know that best estimate of 500 to 1500 years based on past history um, may or may not come to fruition. So great question, but Elfell is still considered active. And when I, when I read that, I thought, and why was I hiking on the top of this active volcano? I, anyway, it's, I just ha had a lot of trust in the measuring devices, the monitoring devices that we would get warned if it was going to erupt again. Thank you, Susan. Uh, another comment from Randy. Thanks for this great presentation, Susan. Welcome. Anyone else have any other questions or comments that they would like to make? I would just like to add, if Vestmanair is not on your bucket list of travel, put it there. It's fascinating. It's a fun place to visit. I love, I only went there in the summer. <laughs> I heard other people that, that traveled there in the winter, that sometimes the ferry is pretty rough and the travel is pretty hard. We just had a balmy experience going each time in the summer across the ocean, but I had some friends who went in the winter and they got they experienced seasickness and they had to go from Thorlock Shelf. And so summertime would be my time of choice to visit. Uh, a lot of tourists don't make the trip over because it takes a little extra effort. But once you're in the south seeing the waterfalls, the ferry is so close. You can divert and take the ferry over and just spend the day there. You don't even have to spend the night there if you don't want to and take the ferry back. Uh, to the mainland and continue on your journey or go to uh, to a housing on the island, on the mainland. So yeah, it's a great place to visit. I can echo your comments most recently, Susan. Uh, we took our three-year-old and one-year-old grandchild children as well as their parents uh, and just did a day trip one year. And uh, they loved it. The, the puffin signs are everywhere. The puffin statue that you showed with your grandchildren. Um, as you said, great restaurants, uh, plenty to see and do. Do check when the uh, museum hours are open because they uh, oftentimes close early. But uh, do a little pre-planning and, and you'll have a wonderful day trip. Uh, a couple comments here, one from Natalie. Thanks for the presentation and also for the work you and your husband did as records missionaries. We all benefit from your efforts. Uh, Susan says, thank you so much. This was excellent. I have been there and this gave me so much more information. I have relatives buried there and went with cousins. It is a beautiful place. So obviously you've done your homework, uh, a well job, a, a job well done, and we very much appreciate that. With those comments, I think we will cease our presentation at this point. And just a reminder that uh, over the next uh, month, the end of January and into February, Icelandic Growth has a myriad of different offerings. I encourage you please to go to the events calendar at uh, icelandicroots.com and uh, check those out. Uh, quite a few uh, interesting things coming up. So without further ado, again, thank you so much, Susan. It was a pleasure to visit with you. Uh, thank you, Doug, for being our technical support. And thank you to all of those who uh, attended the webinar. Uh, again, it will be available on the Icelandic Roots YouTube channel uh, sometime in another week or 10 days. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day, a great day. <laughs>